E13. Um, I'll just give you a little bit. My, as Lisa said, my name is Darlene Bolivar, and I am one of the co-chairs uh, for the CASB Patient Safety Collaborative, and I'm at the IWK Health Center in Halifax, Nova Scotia. And my co-chair, uh, Tracy Rong from CHEO in Ottawa, is not able to be on the line with us today. So you're just going to hear me for today. So I'll just start off with a, a little bit about the uh, CASB Patient Safety Collaborative. We meet um, on the fourth Friday of every month, and so this will be our first call for the 2013 year. And everyone on the line is certainly welcome to join us at all future calls, which will be the, the fourth Friday of the month. Um, you can also uh, check out the agendas or any past presentations on the CAFC Ken website. The Patient Safety Collaborative is really made up of interested uh, folks from around the country who work in pediatrics and have an interest in quality and patient safety. And it is an open collaborative that everybody is willing to join. And we have been meeting for about seven years now. So um, I look forward to chatting with all of you on future calls as well. Um, and our goal is really to have some open dialogue to share some common interests and provide topical presentations on those interests. So um, without further ado, I'll introduce today's topic, which is learning from claims and insurance reciprocals perspective. And our guest speaker today on the webinar is Sarah Chow. And Sarah is from HEROC, the Health Insurance Reciprocal of Canada, and she joined them in 2006. And in her current role at, as a healthcare risk management specialist, she provides responses to a wide range of subscriber queries and other advisory requests from a risk management perspective. And she also presents on topics related to claims and risk management. She was heavily involved in administering HEROC's risk management self-appraisal modules, or for those of on the line who may have participated in that, we fondly call it RMSAM. Um, the program was redeveloped in 2011 to focus on the top risks, and they've now renamed it the Risk Assessment Checklist. Sarah's leading the software implementation of the new program, which was rolled out to subscribers uh, just last fall in 2012. She's responsible for launching the Canadian Healthcare Risk Management Community Forum website in 2009. And in 2011, she led the redevelopment of the Risk Management Claims Analysis Reports, oversees their production and the distribution of the annual mailing. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Biology and Psychology from Wilfrid Laurier University. She received the Chartered Insurance Professionals designation from the Insurance Institute of Canada. She's a member of uh, the Institute, uh, Insurance Institute of Canada Society, sorry, the Chartered Insurance Professionals Society. She's a voting member on the Canadian Standards Association Strategic Steering Committee on Healthcare Technologies and Systems. And she's completed the Risk and Insurance Management Society's Canadian Risk Management Designation Program through the University of Toronto. So all that said, she's well versed in um, uh, talking to us about today's topic. So Sarah, I'm going to turn it over to you. Darlene, thank you very much for that lovely intro. Um, so I'm trying to scroll through my slides. This is what I'm hoping to uh, cover today. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about HEROC, how we've used our claims to assist subscribers with um, patient safety efforts, what we saw in our claims involving pediatric patients that impacted our top risks, and um, as Darlene mentioned, I'll briefly talk about our new risk assessment program, um, which we've called the Risk Assessment Checklist. So I hope um, you find this presentation informative, um, you gain some insight, or it raises some questions for you, which um, we'd be happy to answer. So uh, for those in the audience who are not familiar with HEROC or reciprocals, you might be asking, what is a reciprocal? Uh, well, it's a not-for-profit insurer, and it is owned and controlled by other not-for-profit organizations that it insures. Um, so our owners are the same organizations that, uh, that we provide insurance to. 
these organizations, uh, which we call subscribers, are in the same line of business, and uh, in Herox's case, our subscribers are uh, not-for-profit healthcare-related organizations. And as Darlene mentioned, Herox uh, stands for the Healthcare Insurance Reciprocal of Canada. Um, so organizations in a reciprocal agree to share in losses and profits with other subscribers in the reciprocal. So risk management is an embedded concept of, um, in the sorry, is embedded in the concept of a reciprocal. And having a risk management program is a must. This is one reason why Herox Risk Management Department is around. We're here to assist uh, subscribers in their day-to-day -day work. Um, we do provide full service advisory services uh, to our subscribers at no additional cost. In terms of liability coverage, along with the healthcare organization, HEROC ensures um, its employees and uh, volunteers as well as uh, other, um, other people such as board members and we provide liability coverage to midwives under a separate policy. So if they're working um, at your hospital, um, they're likely insured by HEROC as well. And uh, as most of you know, physicians are covered by CMPA for their clinical work but HEROC does cover non-clinical work uh, done by physicians on behalf of the healthcare organization. So I'm going to jump to um, our next topic now, which is using claims to support patient uh, safety. This Venn diagram on the left uh, shows to scale the interrelationships between adverse events, um, incident reports, and claims. The diagram was compiled using various, uh, various slides, including the Baker Norton study from 2004, uh, which looked at the incidence of adverse events in Canadian hospitals. That study um, used a retrospective chart review and it found that the incidence rate for adverse events is about 7.5% of hospital admissions. Uh, preventable adverse events account for about 2.8% of admissions and incident reports detect about 17% of adverse events detected in that chart reviews and therefore they account for about uh, 1.8%. 2.5% of hospital admissions. Um, that dark blue circle there is for the claims um, and we found that or the studies have found that only 4% of claims have an incident report associated with it. And Herox's perspective is if we collectively work on shrinking the larger circles, the smaller ones will just take care of themselves. Um, and as I mentioned before, the claims um, claims aspect is just a small part of the picture, but HEROC's advantage is in our, our rich claims database. We have the largest medical malpractice claims database in Canada. Um, it's quite unique and it gives us a different lens on the world. We've leveraged this information to provide subscribers with a unique view of the types of risks healthcare organizations face. Um, we believe we have an ethical obligation to share the lessons learned with subscribers. It goes hand in hand with our vision of partnering to create the safest healthcare system. Um, and in doing so, we're not setting standards or establishing guidelines, but we've used good knowledge translation uh, principles. So things like using storytelling or case examples, um, using extreme distillation to get the most important things uh, down on one page. So these are um, things that, that you should take the note of. Um, these are things that will give you the biggest bang for your buck. Um, so we're using these techniques to repackage things that are known. Um, we're, not, um, we're not bringing radical new ideas to the table, but um, these are things that we need to make sure that we're doing all the time. We've also had subscribers asking what are our top risks, um, what can we do to be more proactive in preventing a risk from occurring. Um, and we know subscribers are spending resources on this. Uh, some are finding it a challenge and are looking for help. So we see it as an opportunity for us to address an important subscriber need and to influence um, the priority setting at that organization. A study from 2003 by Eric Thomas found that relative to other methods, the strength of um, claims file analysis lies in its ability to detect latent errors. Latent errors um, include things such as um, 
uh, there's system related issues and examples of this are um, poor design, poor purchase, purchasing decisions, incorrect installation, inadequate staffing, uh, um, things like that. These are difficult to measure uh, because they occur over broad ranges of time and space and they may exist for um, months or even years before something happens, um, before they lead to, to harm related to um, uh, patient care. Because claims include um, information about the types of things that are happening to multiple uh, care providers over time and across different places, it increases the likelihood that uh, latent errors are detected. When HEROC did um, our claims review, we really looked at claims to answer these four questions. Uh, the first one being what can go wrong. So we looked at the types of allegations that were being made, um, any themes in, in the risks that were appearing in, um, in our claims. We, we sort of looked at them and sorted them into categories. We also looked at how bad and how often they were happening. So we looked at um, the frequency and the severity of claims, the severity meaning uh, the claims costs. Uh, that's an another advantage to looking at claims. Um, it, they provide a way for us to quantify harm or loss that has taken place and it translates it into, um, into a number. And, and in this case, um, these are dollars. And finally, we looked at um, what do we need to do? Is there a need for action? Our approach to developing tools to address um, learnings from claims began with the claims review. Um, and we started with the acute care sector at HEROC. We sorted, uh, again, um, we sorted the findings into risk themes or allegations and we sorted again um, by cost and frequency and we came up with a list of top 30 risks and that covers about 85 percent of um, the claims costs for acute care. Once we had that uh, list of risks, we developed risk reference sheets for, uh, for each risk and these sheets are concise resources that contain real case examples from our database. Um, they contain data, uh, data, other resources or references that um, that organizations can uh, can access to find out more information, and as well we've um, we've compiled mitigation strategies to to uh, treat the risk. So um, there, these are things that practical things that organizations can do to um, to mitigate the risk in their organizations, and we've um, we've tried hard to make sure that. The mitigation strategies are practical, they're actionable, and uh, they, really, uh, they really work and are, uh, are relevant. The risk reference sheets were reviewed internally and externally by subject matter experts, and they're also backed by published papers, and we put those papers, again, in the, um, the reference section of the risk reference sheets. After we developed the risk reference sheets, uh, we selected ten, the top 10 mitigation strategies from each set of risk reference sheets to become a module in our risk assessment checklists. So you can think of these as the 10 most important things organizations should do or have in place to effectively um, address each risk. And in terms of uh, prioritization, if an organization wants to concentrate on the most important things, we believe it should be the ones contained in, um, in the checklist or, or uh, the modules. If these things are in place, we believe that um, they will have a positive impact on patient safety and also on the outcome of claims. Um, and in 2012, we went through these steps again for the non-acute care sector. We've completed the risk ranking um, and have developed uh, risk reference sheets for the risks seen in that sector and we plan to have the risk assessment checklists available to uh, non-subscribers, or sorry, non-acute uh, care subscribers in 2013-2014. So here is a, um, a screenshot or uh, a graphic of what our risk reference sheets look like. They're about three pages um, and again they are a resource for subscribers 
they are meant to support patient safety, risk management, and quality of care, and to um, assist in prioritization efforts. They are not clinical practice guidelines. They're not HEROC standards, uh, quote unquote, and because we're not a standard setting organization. Um, and they're not meant to be construed as medical, nursing, or legal advice. These are available on our website to um, subscribers. So if you are a HEROC subscriber and you haven't um, taken a look at these sheets yet, I encourage you to go to our website and have a look. Um, you do need a login ID and password to access them. Um, and if you don't have one, please contact me um, and I can get you a, um, a login. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about what we found in claims uh, when we did that deep dive into, into our claims and um, just talk a little bit about what might be of interest to those working in pediatrics. We'll start with the uh, medication adverse events. This is number 12 on HEROC's top uh, 30 risk of, risks for acute care. The highest claim in this area settled for over $2 million. And really the claims when we were looking at them, um, we found that they came from the administration of um, the wrong medication or the wrong dose. Many of them, actually most of them, um, involve high alert medications such as uh, insulin or opioids. And we often see uh, neonatal and pediatric patients involved in these types of claims. Because of the potential for patient harm, heightened vigilance uh, during uh, medication ordering, uh, preparation, administration, and patient monitor monitoring is needed. Um, a common theme we see in these claims is staff ordering, preparing, um, or administering medications to unfamiliar patient populations such as neonates. So some of the mitigation strategies that, um, that uh, can address this risk is to limit the concentration of high alert meds, um, especially opioids and especially with pediatric patients um, um, at the organization. Adopting dosing and monitoring guidelines for opioids, especially for uh, pediatrics, um, is also a good idea and include the initial and maximum dose recommendations in those guidelines. Um, another suggestion is to uh, dispense high alert medications and ready to use single dose um, uh, single doses, especially with uh, again with the pediatric patients because um, because of the harm that um, that can arise from uh, these patients receiving um, the wrong med or the wrong dose. The failure to identify or manage a hyperbilirubinemia is number 14 on HEROC's top 30 risks for acute care. The highest claim in this area settled for over $8 million. If hyperbilirubinemia becomes severe or prolonged, um, there is a potential for long-term neuro uh, neurological damage. And these claims are usually seen as uh, being preventable, so they are uh, quite difficult to defend. Some of the common themes we've seen in the HEROC uh, claims include um, systematic hyperbilirubinemia assessments not being done on, um, on babies before they are discharged, um, pending uh, bilirubin results not being read or they're not being communicated um, as they should be, and poor compliance with um, hyperbilirubinemia management guidelines. So some of the mitigation strategies um, um, include things like implementing a standardized practice to ensure that all babies are screened uh, for hyperbilirubinemia prior to discharge, um, prohibiting the delegation of um, the authority or accountability for reviewing um, the test results and management um, of, of hyperbilirubinemia to anyone but the most responsible uh, practitioner is also a good idea. Adopting concise and very clearly defined um, algorithms which outline the actions to be taken whenever jaundice is uh, suspected or observed would be um, another uh, good idea. So these risk reference sheets go into um, more detail about, um, about these mitigation strategies. 
The failure to identify or manage IV infiltration is number 19 on HEROC's top 30. Um, the highest claim in this area settled for over $500,000. And depending on the type of medication or the solution that's, um, that's leaked into the tissue um, or the length of uh, exposure, the damage can be quite severe. We've seen in our claims that if damage is to occur, it is more likely in uh, neonatal, neonatal and pediatric patients and um, they involve solutions such as um, blood or vesicants. A common theme that we see in these claims is the irregular uh, inspection of uh, IV sites. So um, these inspections we found um, just weren't happening. At least um, that's what, what the claims had shown um, in terms of the documentation um, So uh, or the charting and um, it, the claims seem to be showing that um, these, these inspections weren't being done. So some of the mitigation strategies include ensuring um, visual and tactile inspections of the IV sites and surrounding tissue on an hourly basis at minimum and to increase the frequency of inspections for high-risk uh, solutions or medications. Um, establishing criteria for identification and severity grading of IV infiltration and also um, adopting IV infiltration management uh, protocols and consider getting an expert team together to do um, IV insertions in pediatric patients um, because we have found that the number of, temp, uh, number of attempts also um, are being seen are also um, shown in our claims. So the higher the number of attempts, the um, the more likely it seems that something can go wrong. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about our risk assessment checklist system. And Darlene um, already mentioned um, some of the uh, the information um, in her introduction. Our previous program, as Darlene mentioned, was called uh, um, RM-SAM, and uh, it was very resource intensive and onerous. That's what um, we heard loud and clear from our subscribers that had been using um, that tool. It was very comprehensive, and uh, some may call it bloated. So um, in 2011, we began to uh, look at streamlining this program just to make it um, a bit more worthwhile, not so resource intensive. Um, and really our aim was to focus on the top risks and the top mitigation strategies. And a lot of this was tied to that risk ranking project that we did. Um, and to focus on the top mitigation strategies, again, we, we chose the top 10 um, mitigation strategies from each risk reference sheet. And this has reduced um, the content overall by 75% compared to RIMSAM. So hopefully we're, um, um, our subscribers are finding that we are focusing in on the most important things, the top risks, the top mitigation strategies. As well, we're hoping to, um, actually we worked really hard to decrease the, the workload and to keep it simple. Action plans and explanations, if uh, you're familiar with the, the previous system, they're still required, um, but for, um, uh, sorry, but we've used drop downs to um, to uh, have these responses in the system before our action plans were uh, free text, but we've standardized them now. So they're all uh, um, in the form of drop downs and hopefully this will uh, decrease the workload that's involved. Um, same as with RIMSAM before, nose and partials do require an action plan. And uh, by simplifying and streamlining the program, we hope to incre increase subscriber enrollment and thus impact the, um, increase the impact on patient safety and claims. The program will be able to provide metrics and peer comparison graphs uh, as well, which was not um, available in our previous program. Uh, we're very excited about the new program and we've had, we've had good feedback so far, so if any of you are using um, the new tool right now, I, I hope to hear uh, some uh, comments from you or questions if you have any. 
this diagram here just shows the um, the main responsibilities of the people involved in um, in the program. So we have a coordinator um, at each organization that's participating. This person is responsible for um, for the coordination of the program, and um, he or she liaises with uh, with HEROC, and they're the go-to person for the participants in um, in the program. And participants are um, what we're calling the subject matter experts, or the ones who um, who would be the best to to respond to the risk uh, the risk modules. So um, these could be um, clinical leaders or operational leaders within the organization, and um, they don't have the sole responsibility of um, putting in answers. They can consult with colleagues or frontline staff, and we do encourage that because we find that uh, when discussions around mitigation strategies happen, um, it brings about a lot of insight into uh, practices at the organization. So the participant's role really is to complete the assigned risk modules um, that have been assigned to him or her and to submit them back to the coordinator. The coordinator, um, again, with before assigning the modules to um, to the participants, they, they liaise with HEROC just to get the program started and they're the ones doing the um, administration of assigning the modules. Um, to participants within the system. And once they get the responses back, they are, um, they've are they got the opportunity to review the responses, to challenge some of the responses that are being submitted to them. And um, we've also asked organizations to identify the top two areas of focus. And these would be uh, the risk module or the risk areas um, um, that are covered in the um, in the program. So um, we know that an organization can't uh, begin to address every risk at the same time. So we're interested in knowing um, which three you're focusing on in the upcoming year. And uh, and then once that's done, um, you submit uh, the coordinator submits the modules to HEROC, and we would review the submissions. And then that completes uh, year one. Year two is similar to year one, um, that we redistribute the um, the risk module. So um, it's a copy of what was submitted in year one that is um, pushed back to the organization. And what they would do is um, go through the risk modules and update any um, responses that have changed. So you're not starting from um, a blank slate. Um, and really year two is, is spent doing the updating. Again, it goes back to the coordinator. The coordinator has one final review before it goes to HEROC. Um, again, three areas of focus are, are um, to be selected and then uh, that gets um, uh, submitted to HEROC and we again do the review. There is a year three as well and that's similar to year two, um, except instead of getting a copy of year one, um, in year three, you're getting a copy of year two, and the same thing would happen. You would, um, or the organization would update um, their responses and then uh, select their three areas of focus and then submit the modules to HEROC, and we would uh, review the submissions and provide feedback if necessary. So this is a screenshot of um, of our risk modules. Um, they're all listed on um, what we're calling the module homepage on our um, uh, on our system. Um, again, we have 30 risk modules based on our top 30 list, and we've also added two core ones. Now these are risks that we saw when we did that, um, that deep dive into our claims. We haven't ranked them, but um, these were themes that were seen um, throughout the, the claims we were looking at. The first one is the inadequate credentialing and uh, performance management of, um, of um, uh, independent uh, healthcare practitioners. And the second one was the, is the inadequate management of lookbacks um, or multi-patient events. There's also a third one, um, and that is on charting or documentation practices. So um, many of our claims had a poor 
documentation practices were um, were shown in some of these claims, we've addressed uh, that risk through a risk reference guide um, that we created uh, last year, um, and that's for healthcare documentation for for healthcare practitioners and organizations. And again, that resource is also uh, available on our website. So taking the screenshot, we're just going to pretend we're clicking into the inadequate sterility uh, module, and that's the, um, the circled one at the top. So once you do that, you're brought to um, a page that lists all of the mitigation strategies. Again, there are only about 10 or so per risk module. Um, they all fit on one page. The actual number uh, of mitigation strategies in each module range from 4 to 11. So those are the minimum and the maximum number of mitigation strategies that um, organizations will have to respond to. And these are the vital few, um, the most uh, important ones, as, um, as uh, I mentioned before. So taking this, uh, this screenshot, if we click into that circled one there, um, and that's the second one from the top, we're brought to um, a, a page where the responses to the mitigation strategy can be entered into the system. So um, at the top in the header area, there's a, um, a description for the participant that's looking at the, um, um, the module. So they can read a bit about what the risk uh, involves. Um, we've also created themes for um, for the mitigation strategies, and we we found that there are common themes to some of the risk modules, and this just allows us to uh, run reports on those common themes. So um, uh, that's available as well through the system, uh, the reporting aspect. The the mitigation strategy is listed there, and uh, that first drop-down is for the response. A, t a score is tied to each response type. Um, so you can, after reading the mitigation strategy, the uh, participant or his or her team would um, assess whether this mitigation strategy has been implemented fully, partially, or has not been implemented at the organization. So um, they would choose a, an answer of yes for um, if the mitigation strategy has been fully implemented, partial if, a, if the uh, mitigation strategy has only been implemented partially, or a response of no if um, it hasn't been implemented. And a score is tied to each of these response types. And this allows us to um, or allows the system to compute an average implementation score for the module. Um, and this just gives you, gives the organization an idea of how um, the extent to which the mitigation strategies in the module have been implemented in the organization. Um, with the, these metrics, um, we can measure change over time and change over risks. Um, when, when organizations go through the cycle um, uh, multiple times. So we can see sort of the changing average, average implementation scores. And uh, these reports and metrics will be um, available through the system. We'll be com uh, compiling comparison reports once we have um, a good number of submissions from our subscribers. And again, those uh, those comparison reports uh, will be pushed out through um, through the portal. But we wanted to wait until um, we had uh, a good size before we we do any um, any comparisons. So this is a mock-up of uh, what we're calling a risk register or a summary report. Um, so we've got the category, uh, the rank, the HEROC rank on the left the category under which the risk falls um, next to that, the risk itself listed, and the average implementation score on, um, on the right. These reports can be exported into um, an Excel document. So you can, um, you can use this as a risk register or um, um, yes, use this as a starting point to insert into your own risk risk register if, uh, if you have one in place, 
or you can use this as a starting point for risk register if you don't. And uh, you can slot in other risks um, that, um, that are not included um, into these reports. As I mentioned before, claims is only a small part of uh, the picture. There are other risks that aren't, um, aren't covered by insurance and aren't seen in claims. So um, the idea is for, for you to use the risk register to either insert your own uh, risks or um, sort of take these risks and, and insert it into one you already uh, have in place. We created uh, user guides for coordinators and participants. Um, HEROC is also available by phone or by email. Um, but we hope that the, the system is intuitive and um, easy enough to, uh, to use. But um, if not, we are here for help. We can also um, go through um, a live demo with the people that would be involved as well. This is uh, just a picture of HEROC's risk management department. These are my colleagues and, uh, and the ones um, who, who uh, are in contact with our subscribers and the ones who, um, who work really hard to, uh, to bring about um, all these great resources. So I just wanted to, to show a picture of them. And that's all I had for uh, this morning. Thanks very much, Sarah. Uh, just a reminder that if you have any questions or comments, you can uh, write them into the, uh, the question box in your control panel. Um, I do have, this is Lisa, so I have one question here to you, Sarah. So is there any thought that the risk reference sheets might be made public? Um, I don't know about that. I know we've uh, put out one uh, risk reference sheet on um, employee fraud, I believe, on our website, um, and that's available to uh, to anyone. But um, these resources are are um, for our subscribers, so um, I don't know if there are any plans to release them to uh, non-subscribers. But I can certainly take that um, that consideration back for discussion. Great, thanks. So, um, uh, Darlene or Elaine, did you have any comments or questions at this point? Yeah, it's, it's Elaine, and uh, I, I, Sarah, I want to say thank you so much for that very, very insightful and um, <clears throat> most comprehensive presentation. Um, <clears throat> I also want to take the opportunity to say Happy New Year to all of our colleagues as well. Sarah, I'm just wondering, um, you, know, you said a few things, going back to almost your very first slide when you sort of showed that larger, you know, the, the diagram of a larger circle and then I think you made a comment and you sort of dealt with, you know, I'll just let you get back there. <laughs> there. So when we look at that sort of the, the chart review adverse events and then the smaller circles, you would, and I totally agree that the, the strategy, HEROC strategy, is if we can deal with the bigger issue than the other ones will, will be resolved. You had referenced um, the Baker Norton paper that was published, I think it was in CMAJ in 2004. I just want to bring your attention to the Canadian Pediatric Adverse Event Study that was just published, sort of the latter, very latter part of of um, 2012, it was in November, I believe, um, by Ann Matlow, uh, Virginia Flintoff, as well as Ross Baker um, uh, and, and, and other colleagues. And I just think that referencing the Canadian Pediatric Adverse Event Study, which in, in, in many ways was modeled on the um, a Canadian Adverse Event Study published by Ross and, and others in 2004 might be a really good idea. Because, of course, the 2004 paper um, and study that was done in 2002 did not include the pediatric population. 
Yes, you are quite right. Um, I I am aware of this uh, this paper, um, and I think we can start to look at um, at um, updating the the diagrams as studies come in. Um, yeah, so I think that would be a good idea. Um, I do know that um, that the 2004 study it did eliminate um, some of the patient populations. They only chose charts from uh, from certain um, areas. So, um, no, you're you're quite right, Darlene. Now that that was Elaine, but but yeah, I, I oh sorry, Elaine. No, no, no problem at all. I think it would be great though if uh, if if you could look into that, and if there was any way we could help you sort of, you know, um, do that, don't hesitate to, uh, to let us know. Okay. And I guess my other, my other comment is more just sort of recognizing the tremendous, um, well, first of all, validation of uh, some, of the, some of the data and, um, and reports and, and sort of referencing your um, mitigation strategies it, it very much there's there's tremendous um, common focus uh, with a lot of the patient safety work that uh, CAFC does on behalf of our with and on behalf of our member organizations, and certainly when when you talked about um, high alert medications and and um, the claims around morphine and in pediatrics being you know some of the most common etc. Um, we, um, our patient safety collaborative, and in particular our high alert medications uh, working group, have been for many years now working on uh, guidelines and a resource kit, et cetera, that is all available um, on CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network. And I'm wondering if maybe offline we could look at ways of potentially linking some of the uh, strategies or or uh, guidelines that you've shared with us today with with some of that work I, I I see tremendous synergy and and not not that there's no um, you know we're really saying the same things and I I, th I see one as complementing the other and of course CAFC is a member of HEROC as well and I just think there may be an opportunity there that um, we could explore Certainly, I think that that makes a lot of sense. Um, anything that we can do to to assist that we would be happy to. Um, so we can uh, we can take that discussion offline and and continue that certainly. Right, and I don't know if anybody online with us, uh, Darlene or Lisa and and other colleagues, um, it would be great to get your feedback on on what you think about that. Because you're certainly flagging issues that are that are well known within our pediatric community. Okay. So I have another comment from Aaron uh, Pollock. It would be great to see how these mitigation strategies correspond to those that come out of patient safety incident reporting and learning systems. So perhaps a project for the future, she say. Mm -hmm. What we're actually hoping to do is um, uh, to show the link between. Um, Putting in place these mitigation strategies and uh, and claims, so um, we're trying to see in a few years' time if there is a correlation between um, mitigation strategies and um, um, a better claims experience. Uh, but that's another good idea. Lisa, are there any more questions online? There's nothing. Uh, there's nothing that's come up uh, just yet. Okay. I have one for you, uh, Sarah. Um, Elaine hit on the two big uh, comments that I was going to make, which was the link to the CPAES study that was uh, uh, published in the in the fall, and the link to the opioid safety strategy. So, um, thanks, Elaine, for doing that. I guess my my question, um, and not being ultimately familiar with or intimately familiar with Iraq, is that uh, pediatric centers are, are and CAFC. Patient Safety Collaborative uh, represents all of them across Canada. So just wondering if your database uh, for your top 30 or your top 10 includes all of the provinces that represent uh, the CAFC Patient Safety Collaborative. Um, 
I don't know which organizations are um, are represented um, through CAPSI, but these are um, organizations that we insure. So those are the only um, only claims information that we have is is um, the the subscribers that that uh, HEROC has. Um, but I can maybe check to see um, if there's a way for us to cross reference the um, yeah. But it, and and one one resource, it's Elaine again. One resource that may be helpful is is our full Cassie's full membership. Uh, in other words, all of our partners and our organizations are documented on our website. So that could be a you know at least one reference point just to see mm -hmm. which organizations we have in common. Mm -hmm. The other reference point I was thinking of might also be um, the Canadian Patients. They, uh, I shouldn't say it, it, that the um, adverse event reporting project that I think is being run out of the Canadian Patient Safety Institute, and uh, it's voluntary, but self-reporting of significant adverse events through that process as well. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess the, um, the other comment that I have is when you were talking about your risk modules and uh, the 30 risk modules that you have and then the, the two core ones, but you commented that you were adding a, um, a third uh, uh, core uh, module, which was the documentation practices, which was also available on your website. And I think, um, speaking out of turn, but I think most organizations, including us, um, certainly struggle with common documentation practices, and we certainly know the, the standards and the theory behind it, et cetera, but when you do chart reviews, um, then you see the reality of what your organization ac actually looks like. And I'm wondering if that's not something that might be of interest across the CAFSI collaborative groups as well, to take a, a deeper dive into looking at some standardization documentation um, practices, policies, guidelines, et cetera, and, and putting a, some work into that as a collaborative. Actually, I just um, I wanted to clarify. I, I think I probably um, was a bit unclear. Um, there isn't going to be a module on documentation. That was uh, just a, another theme that we saw when we were um, reviewing our claims. So um, instead of uh, creating a module to address uh, documentation, we created that uh, reference guide, which is um, um, a bit of a longer document than than our risk reference sheets. But um, the, uh, the that guide is available on our website, um, and w there aren't any plans to um, um, to create a module on documentation for the checklists program right now, but um, as you mentioned, there um, there is a lot of, of work um, that's out there um, on documentation for healthcare, um, and this is a common theme that we see in our claims, and um, and um, so it, for organizations that um, that are finding that their documentation practices aren't um, quite up to par, I mean. I think the thing to know is um, you're not alone. It's uh, <laughs> it's um, it's something that that we see quite a lot. But um, it is important that um, that we we bring awareness uh, about uh, awareness to um, good documentation practices because um, they are important, especially in in terms of uh, defending a claim. Um, what you put in the chart uh, can either save you or, um, or you know, can, can um, what is the word I'm looking for? It can be good or bad depending on, <laughs> on um, what's in the chart. So, yeah. So I have a couple of comments and uh here and so you have uh, on the same topic of um, of charting. So um, from Carolyn Johnson. So within the risk categories that were highlighted, um, it was interesting to see charting and documentation being an area for improvement amongst healthcare providers' professions. This is an important area for focus. So there's uh, you know Carolyn from IWK. Um, yeah, so she's in big agreement. So maybe. Uh, Maybe IWK, you guys can start the the uh, the, the work towards uh, all of this that you were talking about, Darlene. 
And so yeah, then, yeah. At least I'm supported by my colleagues here. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, it was certainly a theme when we, because we were one of the, the sites that participated in, the, participated in the CPAES, and, you know, it certainly wasn't just from us, but that was certainly one of the themes from a patient safety perspective. If you're u using charts, you know, in a, even in a retrospective way, not to defend a claim, but to look at your adverse event rates or to use it as a trigger tool. You know, you certainly need the documentation um, there as well. And, and nationally across Canada, there was huge amounts of variation around the comprehensiveness of documentation that uh, we expected to find and in some cases did and in some cases didn't. Yeah, and I, ha I have some more comments uh, from Aaron. Uh, C uh, CPSI does not run a reporting system, voluntary or otherwise. Uh, I think that might be ISMP Canada you were talking about. That, um, that's correct, it is. So, however, we do run a Global Patient Safety Alert, a repository of patient safety alerts, advisories, and recommendations from 23 organizations around the world. And perhaps HIROC would be one of those organizations in the future. And the Canadian, she also says, the Canadian Medication Incident Reporting and Prevention System is the closest we have to a national voluntary reporting system. You can report medication incidents through either ISMP uh, or Kai High. So, yeah, the CMERPS. Yeah. Yes, sorry. Thank you yeah. for correcting that. Yeah. I was just wondering if anybody online is actually uh, um, uh, using, using this system at all or has, has um, had any experience with it? So any of the people that are listening in, so you can just let me know yes, no, raise your hand, do something, wave a flag. No response. <laughs> so I'm going to guess there's nobody online that's uh, using the system right now. So Sarah, you're, you just rolled this out really in the fall of last year? Yes. Is that correct? So the, the people that participated in the RM SAM, that data could all be incorporated into the assessments for the new checklist process? Um, what we uh, recommended was that if um, there were any ongoing action plans that came out of um, RM SAM, that um, if there is overlap, then, um, then that would be brought over into, um, into the risk assessment checklist system. So uh, let's say you're working on uh, initiative, an initiative on um, uh, patient falls, um, and there, there is some overlap with the mitigation strategies. Um, you can say that that, um, uh, that initiative or that, um, that action plan or is uh, in progress, or if it's been complete and it's um, it's in place, then um, you would uh, respond uh, to to that mitigation strategy with a yes. So um, it's sort of brought over that way, um, but the the data itself from the uh, RM SAM system won't be um, uh, rolled over into. Um, uh, the risk assessment checklist system. We are starting from uh, from scratch at year one, but whatever that you have, have going on um, within your organizations, you can um, you can uh, use that to um, to respond to the mitigation strategies. Okay, I'm just going to try to unmute uh, Carol from Chio. Carol, can you can you respond? You made the comment. You said. Uh, Chio is working uh, with HIROC on this and that it's pretty user friendly. I'm not sure if um, you're able to, uh... no, nope, maybe you don't have a microphone. That's unfortunate. Okay. But that's Anyways, good to so, hear. Uh, Thank Chio you, Carol. Is, is, you there, Carol? Are you there? Oh. Lisa, that was Sarah who was just replying to uh, Carol's comment. Oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry. So, again, so Chio says that they're working with uh, Hiroc and that uh, it's uh, very user-friendly in comparison to RM. Yeah. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. I'm making a note of that. So, Lisa, are there any other questions?
Uh, no, not at this point. So, um, Elaine, do you have any final questions or, or thoughts? No, I, I well, I was going to say no one, and maybe just one. So, just maybe just to reiterate, Sarah, I think that you have flagged a number of opportunities to strengthen um, uh, some of the materials and and guidelines and. Uh, uh, recommendations uh, from here off, and maybe just if we could look together um, um, as you know, as we say offline, maybe at a meeting, uh, future meeting, just to see what we might do to make some linkages. Mm -hmm. um, I think that might be very helpful. But I, I again just want to say thank you for your uh, your excellent presentation. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's been a pleasure, and um, again, I hope you you've gotten um, some insight out of um, this morning. Um, and if there are any questions about the um, the checklist system or the resources we have or um, or anything like that, please feel free to contact me. Um, I'm available at s c h o w at hiroc dot com. Or you can um, email our general inbox, um, which is risk management, all one word, at HEROC.com. And HEROC is H-I-R-O-C. And again, thank you very much for, uh, for inviting me to, um, to uh, this session. Excellent. Uh, thank you, uh, Sarah, for such a, a wonderful presentation. And it certainly uh, opened our eyes and made us think about uh, how claims and patient safety tie together and ways that we can uh, assess that in a more comprehensive way. So thank you for that. And um, uh, I just want to remind folks that are still on the line that our next uh, patient safety collaborative call will be on February the 22nd. And Sarah's presentation will be um, posted on the Ken website uh, within the next few days. And thank you again, Sarah, and thank you for providing uh, your contact information with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. I want to uh, let everybody know, so February 22nd, so sort of on the heels of this, uh, something you know that we've seen as, as high risk, uh, we will be having a presentation from Health Sciences North. They've gone through uh, the process of implementing uh, the, uh, the consensus guidelines for pediatric opioid safety, so the CAPC ISMP Canada consensus guidelines, and they're going to walk us through their process of that implementation. And uh, so again, February 22nd. Great. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thank you, Darlene. Thanks, Lisa. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a good weekend.